Hi guys, this is Fiona from IELTS Exam Training Courses and Members Academy. Today I've had a special request from one of my members and it's about a particularly difficult reading passage one. Now normally I think passage one is relatively easy. It is supposed to be one of the easiest ones and often they talk about maybe a, a life story and the structure is chronological. However, this time we've got something completely different and yeah, it's difficult. The title is The Concept of Intelligence and uh, it's more a discursive uh, theoretical, research-based, academic argument than a nice, neat, chronological story of somebody's life. So that gives us something. That tells us that it's going to be divided according to the theory and evidence model. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that very, very clearly it's divided into two halves and this division is very clearly outlined by the writer. It has to be clear and because it's an academic piece of writing. So it has to really give you the structure and uh, outline it for you. So we can see this is in the first paragraph where it tells us it's going to talk about the concept of intelligence and it will tell us as always that there's a problem. No one knows for certain what it actually is. This chapter addresses how people conceptualize intelligence. So this whole idea of how people conceptualise intelligence is quite difficult, I think. It says in the same paragraph that people have unconscious notions um, and they define the term implicit theories. So these two terms, implicit and unconscious, tell us that we have theories about intelligence that maybe we don't express. They are what we think, they are implicit. But the problem is um, that nobody really knows what it actually is. Then there's a very clear question, again in the introduction, it says, why should we even care what people think intelligence is, as opposed only to valuing whatever it actually is? There are at least four reasons people's conceptions of intelligence matter. So the writer has told us that he or she is going to outline the four reasons why people's conceptions of intelligence are important, why they matter. And the next four paragraphs are simply that. B says first, C second, D third, and E finally. So those are the four reasons which the writer has already outlined for us. Then there's the second half of the reading where the writer mentions or introduces other theories. So Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian and Jacksonian. Those three people had different theories. So paragraph G is the Hamiltonian view, paragraph H, Jeffersonian, and I is Jacksonian. And they kind of progress in certain ways. So it leaves us just with one paragraph out on a limb, outside that structure. And very often they leave this paragraph and ask you one question about it at the end. That's not exactly what happens today, but we will use that last paragraph for one of the questions. There are three sets of questions and we can very clearly see that the third set uh, relates to that second half of the reading text. 
So we can put them aside for a moment and then go back to focus on questions one to three, which is all about matching information. And then questions four to six, which is yes, no, not given. You remember we said that the first half is divided into these four theories about what intelligent or the concept of intelligence is. And those are four separate paragraphs following the introduction. The introduction said that no one knows for certain what it actually is. And let's have a look now at those four uh, reasons why their intelligence, what they think about intelligence is important. The first reason when you skim and scan it, it's all about, for example, parents theories. And then it talks about job interviewers theories and even like people deciding on their friends. So it's all about everyday examples and they actually say our everyday lives. When you look at the second reason, it goes more to scientific investigators. Now, a lot of what's in this paragraph I find really difficult to follow. And I would definitely find that difficult in an exam. But they're just talking about oh, the implicit theories of scientific investigators give rise to their explicit theories. Implicit theories provide a framework in defining a phenomenon. <laughs> These implicit theories can suggest what aspects of the phenomenon have been more... Oh, God. Yeah, so you can see it. it the second example seems to say that scientific investigators can give their ideas explicit theories. Thirdly, they talk about when an investigator suspects that existing explicit theories are wrong. So again, it's gone one step further from what everyday people think. Then the scientific investigators who create the explicit theories and then the scientific people who discover that some theories are wrong. And finally, it mentions how these theories of intelligence can help elucidate developmental and cross-cultural differences. People have expectations for intellectual performances that differ for children of different ages. How these expectations differ is in part a function of culture. So here it's talking about how culture influences in some way our beliefs about intelligence. For example, expectations for children who participate in Western style schooling are almost certain to be different from those for children who do not participate in such schooling. So those are the four reasons why um, what, what we believe about intelligence is important. The first one is about what everybody thinks. Second and third are about what scientists think. And the final one is all about how culturally we see things differently. Now, when you look at the questions and matching information, the first thing says information about how non-scientists assumptions about intelligence influence their behavior towards others. So you don't really have to read much more. The main thing here is non-scientist assumptions and that comes in paragraph B. So that is the answer because that is where we talked about parents, friends, job interviewers and they are the non-scientists. In question two, it says a reference to a lack of clarity over the definition. 
Now, whenever you see the word definition, it usually means that there are these two kind of quote marks or inverted commas. So there is your definition and it says no one knows for certain what it actually is. So that very simply gives us A. Finally, three, the point that a researcher's implicit and explicit theories may be very different. Well, it's either going to be C or D. I had to guess here, but it is clear in D, it says that implicit theories uh, existing explicit theories are wrong or misleading. So uh, it's that paragraph where it talks about implicit. There you go. Just underline it implicit and explicit. So that gives you D. So I'm not understanding a lot of this. All I'm doing is looking at key words in the text and to a certain extent hoping for the best. I'm just picking out words and matching them. And the same goes for the yes, no, not given questions coming next. You can see there are three questions and this will mean that one is yes, one is no and one is not given. I always suggest that you guess these. Number four says slow language development in children is likely to prove disappointing to their parents. Now we know there's a paragraph about language development and the parents and how they uh, maybe correct their children but it doesn't mention anything about there's nothing emotional there's no idea that it's disappointing you could probably guess that, that an academic article is not going to say that parents feel disappointed by their child's slow language development. You could probably guess that that is not given and it certainly is not given. Now, number five, people's expectations of what children should gain from education are universal. So look at what that question is saying. It says that what people expect from the education system, those expectations are the same all over the world. Now how likely is that to be true? Universal meaning everybody believes it. Is that going to be true that everybody has the same expectations from education? Well, no, of course it's not. And then you're looking for something which says the opposite. So the opposite of universal, meaning everybody thinks the same, is different. And that comes in paragraph E where they talk about cultures and expectations are almost certain to be different different and that word is clearly spelt out for you. So that gives you number five is certainly no. So what does that leave you with? Number six, you guess it will be yes. It says scholars may discuss theories without fully understanding each other. Now this is the tricky one because this is the paragraph at the end so I'm going to leave that till later, but I'm going to guess that it will be a yes. You can imagine that scholars discuss theories without fully understanding each other. And I'll show you how that answer works when we come to the last paragraph. Let's look now at the second half of the text. In the second half of the text, we are introduced to these three theories, Hamiltonian, Jeffersonian and Jacksonian. So let's look at them individually very quickly. Again, skimming and scanning. Hamiltonian, it says people are born with different levels of intelligence and those who are less intelligent need the more intelligent people to keep them in line. So 
it's almost chronological in terms that it sounds quite old fashioned. Well, very old fashioned. I mean, they, they relate, they talk about Plato, the philosopher, <laughs> and about a high IQ elite who should take responsibility for the irresponsible masses of non-elite or low IQ people. Crazy, right? Left to themselves, the unintelligent would create a kind of chaos. So the, the first view is quite a shocking one. It seems really outdated and old fashioned that intelligent people should be in charge. Yes, the less said about that, the better. So we're moving on to the second view, the Jeffersonian view, and it's more moderate, is that people should have equal opportunities and that people are rewarded for what they accomplish. And this is what the writer agrees with. He says, my own views are similar and the children should just take the opportunity to make the full use of the skills they have. So that's the kind of moderate view. Now, when you go to the last view, you imagine it might be a bit more extreme on the other side. And here it is. It says that all people are equal, that actually anybody could do the same job or be in the same position of responsibility. And it, skills are interchangeable. And we do not need or want any institution that might lead to favouring one group over another. So that one's saying that anybody can learn to do anything and anybody can do any job. So it's more extreme on the other side. And that kind of puts these ideas into a list of extreme because it's bad, the middle view, and then extreme because it, well, might not be true. <laughs> so let's have a look at the seven statements or beliefs that you have to match to these theories. Number seven says it is desirable for the same possibilities to be open to everyone. Well, Pretty simple there. It's the first view. Uh, sorry, not the first one. That was the crazy one. It's the first moderate view. And it says the first line, people should have equal opportunities. So that is paragraph H. Be careful what you write. That is B is the answer. And sometimes it helps to actually write those. So the first idea was A. I'm writing these on my test paper, A, B and C, to help me link the right person. Statement number eight, no section of society should have preferential treatment at the expense of another. So that will be either H or I. And if we look at I, it says we don't want to favour one group over another. It's almost exactly the same words, so that gives us C. Number nine, people should only gain benefits on the basis of what they actually achieve. So this came up here, people are rewarded for what they accomplish. Synonym for achieve is accomplish. It's the moderate view in the middle. Number 10, variation in intelligence begins at birth. This idea that you're born um, intelligent or not is the extreme view. It says people are born with different levels of intelligence and that is therefore A. 11. The more intelligent people should be in positions of power. That crazy extreme view where it says government officials eventually take responsibility for the masses. Yes, so it's the extreme view. It's A. Everyone can develop the same abilities. That's the kind of, um, how true is that? Can we all really develop the ability to do anybody's job? That's kind of extreme opposite, isn't it? So it's this one, the C, Jacksonian view, where it says, Almost any position of responsibility can be done by anyone. 
So that's the crazy view in the opposite way. It's the last paragraph or C. And then finally, people of low intelligence are likely to lead uncontrolled lives. Again, the crazy view is that if you're in unintelligent, then you'll create chaos. That was A. I've been through these really quickly because I haven't spent too much time analysing exactly what they're talking about. I've spent time using the structure of the text and looking for keywords to help me. And that took me about 15 minutes. Of course, there's this last paragraph which we didn't deal with. And it was this idea that until scholars are able to discuss their theories, they are likely to miss the point of what the others are saying when discussing their explicit theories. It was question six of the yes, no, not given. Scholars may discuss theories without fully understanding each other. And just that word scholars there, until scholars are able to discuss their theories, blah, 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 they are likely to miss the point of what others are saying. So that's correct, yes. They may discuss theories without fully understanding each other. Okay, that was a difficult one. It would really help if you see that text on screen. So I would encourage you to go and watch the YouTube video and it might make a little bit more sense to you. Thanks very much for listening today. Thank you for your patience. I hope that helped a little bit. Don't worry if it didn't. It's an extremely difficult listening, unusual for part one. So just stick with my advice. Break down the text into the way that the writer wrote it. The, wrote, the writer split it up into three parts. The answers are simply based on key words and the rest are guessable. All for now. Bye-bye.